So we were scheduled to travel to Scottsdale in early April um, for a similar event hosted by our longtime supporter, Carrie Strike, and her husband, Stephen. Unfortunately, as most of you know, when the pandemic hit, we had to cancel those plans. So, um, but since that time, our wheels really were turning and we decided that we needed to find a way to bring Dr. Wagner's exciting updates to our donors, despite our inability to travel. So here we are. Um, I wanna thank Carrie Strike for switching gears with us. And instead of hosting us in her home last month, she's now moderating this webinar. Carrie and her family have been longtime friends of CCRF and fierce advocates for better treatments for children with cancer for decades. Uh, last year, the Erickson family was presented with CCRF's highest honor, the Dream Maker Award, for their truly outstanding support of our battle against childhood cancer. Carrie has served CCRF um, as president of Club Butterfly, co-chair for two Dawn of a Dream galas, and chair of the board of directors. Carrie, as always, you stepped up for us when we needed you. So thank you for being our moderator for today's webinar. You're welcome, Kenna. Thanks a lot. When, as you said, when our event got canceled and you came to me with this idea, I was so excited to be able to jump at the opportunity to not only um, hear what we missed out on from Dr. Wagner down here in Scottsdale, but also how his work is now merging with our battle against COVID-19. Um, research for childhood cancer and COVID-19 have a lot more in common than you might think. And that's the point of today's webinar. We'll hear from Dr. John Wagner, whose work has led to better therapies for kids fighting cancer. And now that expertise is helping unlock clues to fighting this global pandemic as well. Uh, a few housekeeping points before we get into this. Uh, there is a question and answer Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And if you have any answers that you'd like to submit, feel free to do it via that button and we'll answer as many as time allows. And if you would like to rewatch this uh, webinar at any time or share it with friends, a uh, link to it will be made available to you probably sometime next week. So let's get to our program. Uh, Dr. John Wagner is the founding director of the new Institute for Cell, Gene, and Immunotherapy and co-director of the Center for Transitional Medicine at the University of Minnesota. He is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Minnesota Medical School and now holds two endowed chairs, the Children's Cancer Research Fund Hedgeback Family Chair in Childhood Cancer Research and the University of Minnesota McKnight Presidential Chair. Dr. Wagner's own research is focused on the development of various cell immunotherapies for treatment of life-threatening cancers and rare genetic diseases. He is best known for his pioneering work on the use of placental cord blood as a store for stem cells transplantation, excuse me, a procedure that has now been, for, been performed in over 50,000 patients worldwide. So thank you, John, for being, us, for being with us here today. I know we're all really excited to hear what you have to say. Um, you've been tapped by the state of Minnesota to help with the response to COVID-19. How does your expertise in childhood cancer and cell and immunotherapies apply to a respiratory disease and a pandemic? Well, Carrie, thank you. And you know, it's, I wish I could see all of you that's on, on, the, on the Zoom currently. And certainly, you know, we wish we were all there together. And um, Carrie, thanks for having invited us to come in April, but we'll have to do it another time. Sure. But you know, <laughs> the thing is, is that you know, like everything else, we have to adapt and adapt pretty quickly. Um, and uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to just share with you today, um, because it's actually kind of surprised me over the past couple of months of what we're able to accomplish. So if you don't mind, I'm going to start off with just a little bit of a presentation, Carrie, and then we can get back to your questions specifically. Okay. Um, and and uh, I thought what I would do is give you a little bit of background about you know, the pandemic currently and, and then also talk about how we've been able to, in a sense, take advantage of this crisis to make it so that we can move some of our cancer therapies forward more quickly. So for, for, for those of you that are um, seeing the slide now, is that I wanted to put the context of this pandemic you know, uh, in relation to other pandemics that have occurred in the past. And clearly, you know, if you look at the worst pandemic the world has ever experienced, it was the Black Death back in, you know, the Middle Ages. 
But more recently, we've had also several major pandemics. Uh, back around 19, 18 to 1920, we had the Spanish flu, which uh, was uh, a major crisis that actually resulted in, in part, ending World War I because it impacted so many people around the world with about 50 million people estimated to have died as a result of that particular flu. But remember that you know, uh, understanding the flu and how it passes you know, from one individual to the next, um, they had only a very rudimentary idea of how, how, to, how to prevent this and treat this uh, in contrast today. And then you also perhaps may have not realized the major impact HIV has had around the world um, you know, we we talked a lot about this in the 1980s, but you know, it still continues today, and it certainly has been one of the major pandemics uh, that have existed in, in history. But COVID-19, although still in process, and certainly we don't know what that number will finally turn out to be, you know, you can see here that it's relatively small to many of the other pandemics that have occurred in the past century, and hopefully we can keep it very small um, with a bit of luck. Next slide. Are you able to? Yes. So, you know, the reason for showing you this slide, this is what one of the wards looked like in a hospital in Philadelphia back in the 1918, 1920 period. And you can see here a couple of things. One is you see a very packed ward. Oh, they all apparently had symptoms of the flu. You see lots of people, but you also see um, that the people are wearing masks. If you look at the, the front um, in the middle, you can see though they're wearing masks around their chin. Uh, and both the doctor and the patient there um, are not wearing masks properly. And I bet if you walked around, you know, the streets, you see that as well. And clearly, you know, the mask is important in pr protecting others from the infection that you have. Uh, but uh, if it's not worn properly, it doesn't work very well. But they didn't understand, you know, flu like we understand flu today. Let me go to the next slide, because I think what you'll see in the next slide is that things look a bit more sophisticated, although overall look about the same. So you can see here, this is today's pandemic and what it looks like in ICUs around the world, um, where there's uh, more patients than they have ever seen. And remember, you know, typically we have ICUs that are about 75% capacity with just the day-to-day post-surgical cases, as well as it could be a heart attack, could be, you know, some a serious uh, uh, infection. So adding, you know, influenza, such as the COVID-19, uh, um, this is something that's above and beyond what already exists. And this is why there was so much concern about, you know, the ability of having sufficient numbers of uh, ventilators and sufficient numbers of ICU beds. But it also goes to sufficient blood supply um, you know, in addition, because people are afraid to donate blood, uh, you know, as they ordinarily would. Um, and then there's also other shortages, shortages in that PPE you've heard so much about, that the frontline doctors and nurses and others, you know, aren't able to protect themselves uh, always as they should be to prevent them from getting sick. Because what happens if they're out of commission, how's gonna, who's going to take care of the patients? And that's why it's such a high priority. Um, and there's the, the, the testing issues and, and all that. And we can discuss that in the question and answer period. But the reason for showing you this is that this is what it looks like in an ICU, um, you know, particularly in the big cities. Next slide. So what is the, what is the, what is the patient uh, experience? And this is you know, one aspect, the one we focused on, which is the pneumonia that occurs. And it's actually very interesting looking at the pattern on the CT scan. This is very atypical. This is not the typical pneumonia that I would ordinarily see in a patient. Um, it's got almost this round, you know, fluffy, you know, cotton wool, cotton ball type appearance. Um, it's very, very, um, you know, it's not what we call it, you know, specific for COVID-19, but it is an unusual pattern that you could probably make a good estimate of the diagnosis based on this alone, even without viral testing. Um, but this is actually the beginning phases, and this is why you have the dry cough uh, because of the areas of inflammation there. But the entire lung can white out. So that's the dark area. The darker it is, that means the more air there is. The whiter it is, that means it's more fluid-filled or self-filled. In the middle there is the heart. Next slide. But the one thing that faces the patients today is that being alone, um, not only alone from their families, but alone because even the doctors and nurses go into the room very infrequently. And although I have a slide of one of our patients receiving cells, 
uh, uh, as a cell therapy for preventing the complications of the pneumonia. Um, what you would see is that all the, uh, the, the IV poles um, are outside the room, as you can imagine, these long lines, uh, so that the nurses can, in particular can be doing much of the care immediately outside the room so that the patient is really completely isolated uh, from not only family and friends, but by nurses and doctors and other technicians that are typically around an ICU patient. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind is the psychological impact, because even though these patients are on ventilators, they're not, uh, um, they're not uh, entirely um, sedated because um, you want them to breathe on their own as much as possible. So that must be very frightening in a sense. Next slide. So this is what a normal lung looks like. You can see those white areas, which are really air sacs, and you can see the blood vessels and uh, what it looks like for the bronchi, bronchi and bronchioles, which you know, you've, you've heard the term bronchitis when that gets inflamed. But you, you expect to see lots of air sacs, and then you see you know, some blood vessels in between because that's how the blood gets oxygenated by going through the, the lung supply. But if you look on the next slide, you see what it looks like in a patient uh, with COVID-19. At the top, you can see the viral particles. So this is viruses, you know, um, uh, in electron micrograph, look, you know, attached to the walls of these alveoli, the, the air sacs. And, there, and you can see just how many there are. And what that does is it results in an inflammatory response. And although I'm not going to go into details, you look at the pathology of the lung, which is on the bottom two pictures. Uh, and these are very specific types of cells responding to the virus itself. Um, and it's that... Uh, cell that has that contains the virus that results in this massive inflammatory response um, and that's important to know because when I talk to you about some of the treatments I'm going to develop or help develop uh, that's part of the strategy is to take care of that inflammatory response next slide so this is what it looks like in a cartoon you see that the, the SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus and you've heard of the spike protein and you've seen this picture many many times before so keep in mind that the SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. The disease is COVID-19. So the COVID-19 is not the virus. It's the disease that results as a result of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and, um, and so what it does is it binds, you know, the, uh, as you may have heard about in the news, it binds a specific receptor um, called the ACE2 receptor, and that's how it gets into the cells. And so this gives us another strategy that if we could develop a antibody that would block that binding, that might prevent infection from occurring. Um, but we're gonna get into that in a bit because when we talk about immune therapies, and you know, we're not talking about just about cell therapies, we're talking about antibodies as well as cells. And I'll describe that in more detail, at least as what, what, how we're approaching this uh, disease. Next slide. So, you know, as um, was stated, you know, I become the head of the Institute for Cell Gene and Immunotherapy. And, there's two deputy directors, uh, Jeffrey Miller and Bruce Blazer, and you've probably met either Bruce Blazer alone or maybe some of you, Jeff Miller, um, but both of the, those individuals have been working in cell therapies for a long time with me, uh, focused on cancer. But because we have so much experience with cell therapies in contrast to most other people around the institution, that's why we became the leaders in the institution, uh, of the institute itself. And what this cartoon is also showing is that we interact with many medical school departments, you know, broadly beyond cancer. Uh, but the reason for the size of the interactions, um, you know, cancer by far is the bulk of uh, our work because both uh, Jeff Miller, Bruce Blazer, and I um, are um, um, reside in the cancer center. And so it's not surprising that the bulk of work that this institute does today is, is cancer related. One thing I should also point out to you, um, in particular, uh, Carrie, um, and your parents, uh, was that the one thing I promised last year is that what we would do is we would focus on getting uh, hiring two new directors, one for operations and one for business development. And those people are now um, in place or about to be in place. Um, for example, the operations director is coming in from Seattle. Um, and actually, our first our start date will be June 15th. Um, not a very great way, perhaps, of beginning work at a new institution, but nonetheless, uh, she's got lots of experience in, in uh, moving these types of cell therapies forward. So that's one uh, part of this that's quite fun and, and uh, rewarding to see have been accomplished. But in any case, our major objective is to accelerate these novel cell therapies. And when I wrote this slide, you know, shortening the time to first in human clinical testing, I was hoping to shorten the time to maybe a year or two 
And what we're seeing now is that we're doing it in, in a month. Um, and so we've also now figured out that, you know, it's, it's possible, um, something that we never thought possible before, but it takes a crisis like this to, to do things that are what previously were thought to be impossible. And we'll probably never quite go back to the old way. But in any case, um, lots of different institutes feed into this uh, uh, institute and, um, you know, including regenerative medicine and immune therapies for a variety of diseases. But again, our, our primary uh, goal is to find new ways of tackling cancer, at least when we get beyond, when we get beyond COVID-19. Next slide. So what we're doing now is that, you know, right now, the uh, University of Minnesota, like almost all universities, if not all universities, have shut down all basic laboratory work. So whatever we were doing in cancer has had to be put on hold since February. Um, and so even projects that were ongoing in February have had to be stopped, eliminated, you know, or, you know, whatever was in progress had to be stopped. Um, and that now has set us way back, you know, at least a couple of months and hopefully not too much longer. But what we've been able to do is we've been able to bring in people to focus now or to pivot in a sense uh, who were expert in making CART T cells for cancer or uh, uh, what CTL means is cytotoxic T lymphocytes uh, that were focused on cancer um, and NK cells focused on cancer and on and on to change that to focus those same cell populations in the treatment of, of this virus. What we've been doing now, which why it's shown in red, is that the first three projects are going to be what's called an NK cell project, a mesenchymal stromal cell project, and antibodies against a specific uh, enzyme called ADAM17. Um, in addition, we're going to be focusing on convalescent plasma as our first demonstration projects moving forward uh, in this area. But you can see in black, there are many, many other choices that we hope to bring forward uh, in the not too distant future. And we know that the government is going to invest heavily into um, finding new ways of tackling um, uh, this disease. In addition to coming up with new vaccines, it's going to be ways of how do you then minimize the damage of the, the, the virus uh, once it gets uh, started. Um, and so there's a lot of work to be done in various strategies, and we're trying to take a comprehensive approach. But again, all these things that you see in front of you, uh, at least shown from, you know, the uh, Adam 17 on up above, all those things were cancer related until just now. Um, so we have a heavy focus on cancer, um, and I'll describe that in a bit more detail. Next slide. So what this is, is showing you pictures of uh, mesenchymal stem cells. These are stem cells that uh, come from the bone marrow, can, can also come from fat, it can come from uh, the placenta, a variety of tissues can be the starting material, but this happens to be from bone marrow. And if you go to the next slide, what you'll do is you'll see um, what some of the functions of these cells are. And just look on the right-hand side, what these cells can do, and the way I've employed them in the past is a way of preventing some complications of bone marrow transplant. But it's also been used as a strategy for reducing the side effect of pneumonias, um, even before the, the uh, COVID-19. And what, how it works there is it actually suppresses certain chemicals that we call pro-inflammatory cytokines. And it also suppresses the immune response because what happens in COVID-19, as it does in, for example, the cytokine storm that you may have heard about that's uh, part of, CART, of the CART T cells, um, what it does is it helps prevent the uh, sort of the veracity of that, that storm. The release of all these chemicals comes out that actually uh, re recruits a massive number of inflammatory cells. Think of like you know, if you have a, a splinter in your hand and you know, after a day you'll find that there's pus around and it's red and it's sore. What's happening there in a very small scale is that your immune system is responding appropriately trying to get rid of it. But sometimes in the lung it can go too fast and so, so fast that it actually causes damage itself where the patient might not be able to survive that, that inflammatory response in, unless you can slow it down. And the purpose of the mesenchymal stromal cells or the mesenchymal stem cells is to modulate that immune system so it's not quite so rapid in its response and also it suppresses the release of these cytokines that cause further inflammation and damage. So next slide. The reason why I present, presented that to you is that that's a strategy that we, um, I've now just submitted to the FDA after working on the project for the past month. We began manufacturing the cells and we expect to be uh, uh, treating the first patient in the ICU with, uh, on a ventilator who has this severe um, 
pneumonia resulting from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and uh, it will be a strategy that's going to be um, giving three uh, doses of the cells over a week period. Uh, and if that is a, uh, if that shows promise, we'll markedly enlarge the, uh, the manufacturing and, and number of sites. Right now, we have three sites around the country um, and a couple of others who are interested. And we talked to the, uh, the National um, Institutes of Health yesterday who were very interested in uh, helping support that. But unfortunately, there is no funding to support the study up probably until October. And so we're just finding ways of how we can you know, pay for these studies that currently exist uh, because there is no funding right now for it. But that's another issue. And right now, our major focus is trying to help the patients and we'll deal with the finances later. So, the, but that's now tackling you know, the, the, a side effect that occurs once you've been infected. However, as many of you might guess, is that there's something called the viral reservoir. And what happens, and one of the reasons why they test the back of your nose frequently is because the virus you know, first you know, uh, binds to the cells that are um, you know, the, the, lymphos, the lymph, uh, lymphoid cells, um, you're part of your immune cells that are in the back of the nose. And it starts there before it goes into the lung. And so what we have come up with is another strategy where we're taking advantage of this cell in our left lower panel there. It's called a natural killer cell. cell. And these natural killer cells are the immune cells that naturally go through your body to help protect you from viruses. Now, although we use these cells and uh, um, engineered them to kill cancer, um, uh, what we've done is that we have, um, are taking advantage of their natural ability of, uh, of killing the viral reservoir. What they do is they go around your body, they find cells that are not normal. And cells that are harboring the virus because it's been infected are no longer normal. And what they do is they, they recognize it and they kill it. What we've done, which is uniquely different, and again, it was made for cancer purposes, is that we've engineered the natural killer cell to have certain receptors that improve its killing function, um, and it also uh, persists for a longer period of time, and it homes to those areas where the virus is hidden in cells. And so we now have another project that was just approved actually Wednesday, um, two days ago uh, for um, opening the trial uh, um, at the University of Minnesota. And so that trial is just getting started now. So we'll have the first results coming probably in about a week. But this is going to be something that is for patients who aren't as sick as the ones that are getting the mesenchymal stem cells. These patients will be those that are in the hospital because they're sick enough, but uh, they will um, not be so sick because we want to catch them. We want this to be an effective strategy early on in the process. Next slide is now tackling another uh, strategy moving forward. Um, and if you can just press one more time, um, that'll give you the whole picture. What we're doing is we're engineering uh, the, the, the cells. As you can see here, this was the natural killer cell, which we engineered so that it would more specifically target a tumor cell. Well, we're going to use that same approach. Uh, what we've done is that we made these cells. Uh, they've already been made in large numbers. And so we genetically modify this so that it will now attack cells that um, have the, vir the virus in it. And so again, again, I'm just going to let you know that you know, we haven't lost our main mission here of finding ways of curing different cancers, uh, both in kids and in adults. Uh, but uh, we're repurposing these cells to th have that same killing activity, but we make it focused on the SARS-CoV-2 or uh, the cell itself that contains those viruses where the cells or where the virus replicates before it then releases more virus into the rest of the body. Next slide. So lastly, this is uh, before stopping, I just want to show you that this is now an antibody approach and this was a bit more difficult to, to follow. But suffice it to say that what we found is that when the virus binds the ACE2 uh, receptor, um, what that does is that when that receptor uh, virus binds and the virus goes into the cell, it also loses that ACE2 receptor. And what that does is it activates uh, something called Adam-17. Um, and that, what that does is it increases the inflammation and all those inflammatory cytokines I mentioned previously. And so what we want to do is that we found an antibody that we happen to be developing, again, for cancer purposes. And I can explain that later. But this antibody that's directed against Adam-17 will actually prevent the release of all those cytokines uh, that will cause this major inflammatory reaction that results in turn 
uh, the manifestations of COVID-19. And so some of you, you know, all of you have heard about the pneumonia um, that, that brings people into the hospital the majority of times, but you might have also heard about the inflammation now that they've noticed in kids called Kawasaki's disease, which is in the coronary arteries, uh, the heart arteries, uh, but also you may have heard COVID toes, where it's inflammation around your toes and the small blood vessels, but it's also causing stroke um, in, in a number of patients, which is increasing in fr uh, severity, uh, frequency. Um, and uh, these same approaches uh, can be used for any of those indications, although we've focused originally on the pneumonia uh, because that's the most common thing. But in any event, um, the inflammation is really the hallmark of this COVID-19 disease. And so we've come up with now you know, three different strategies for tackling uh, this, this disease um, and coming up with other ways that I'm not showing you today of making antibodies that will uh, target or, or block uh, even the, the virus from binding to the receptor of the cell to begin with. Ultimately, what we need is a vaccine. And although you've seen lots about that on the news, uh, that will take a while. Um, and although there's many things in progress, you know, it's no guarantee that one vaccine will uh, be um, the answer uh, for all time. It could be like our other flu uh, viruses where um, it's a new virus strain each year. Uh, but obviously we have to just be prepared. Like everything else we do in cancer, we always have to have a plan B. And that's what we're trying to make sure that we have, not only like taking care of the patients today, but also what happens if the vaccine itself doesn't answer all questions. And I think that that's the last slide, is that correct? I'm gonna try just one more, see if that's the end. Yeah, well, I guess the last thing here is that you should be aware that because we've been shut down in terms of the non-COVID work, the University of Minnesota is really taking a big hit like everybody else um, because of the shutdown, because people can't do the work that they have been hired to do. And so many, many of the people there have been laid off. Fortunately, um, we have not been uh, because we're focused on the COVID-19. And what I'm trying to do is come up with ways of making sure that we don't lose all the, the key personnel in the uh, institute and in, uh, in the different labs in the cancer center, because if we lose them, it'll be hard to replace and get started back on the cancer research for which you've helped us so many years. But the first thing we have to do is we have to tackle the COVID-19 um, and we get the place back on track. But right now, uh, the university is taking a major hit um, just by, as you see here, $500,000 every day during the government shutdown. Uh, because of lost students and because of lost work uh, that uh, brings in the revenue to allow us to, to um, keep going. But nonetheless, if that's the end, that is for sure the last slide. And why don't we spend the last you know, part of the time here answering questions? Well, one question we've had is that obviously, and as you just um, explained to us, uh, the medical and research community's response to COVID-19 has been very swift. Can this rapid pace then turn around and be applied to research for pediatric cancers? Yes, and that's, that's one of the benefits of all of this is that what we've done is that many of the bureaucratic uh, uh, um, systems that were previously in place have been broken down. And what we've seen is that we've been able to do things at a pace that not previously um, observed. And I think that, um, you know, again, this is one of the positives that come out of all this is that you now that we know how fast things can go in the bureaucratic, you know, slow pace of before, we'll never go back to the old way. It might not be as fast as now because I'm not sure that we can keep up the pace, you know, that we've been, you know, working more like 20 hours a day rather than, you know, the typical, you know, 15 hours a day. Um, but, uh, but, but still, it won't go back to the old way. So this will be a new paradigm. Um, some more questions from our attendees. We have, um, are children who are undergoing cancer treatment more susceptible to, contract, to, con to, to contracting the coronavirus? Well, the answer is they're probably more susceptible, but on the other hand, you know, if you would ask any of my patients right now, they would say, you know, well, this change in, you know, uh, you know social distancing and uh, lockdown at home, uh, that's our, you know, sort of welcome to my world, <laughs> you know, so this is nothing new for them, you know, um, as, as for those that are on this call that have had a child or have a loved one who's had cancer therapy, you know, they're not out in the, you know, public as often. And so what we're experiencing, maybe this gives us a better appreciation of what their life is like at the end of the day. But, you know, I, you know, one thing I can tell you is that so far, I've not had a single patient who is the most immune suppressive, which is a bone marrow transplant patient, 
I've not had a single patient so far, but that's because they're staying away. Um, and then, and what um, are you seeing as the long-term effects of cell and gene therapies on your young cancer patients? Uh, we've had questions specifically as to reproductive health, but just in general. Sure, sure. So, so the, long, the long-term consequences are is that these cell therapies are not only more effective, um, and I can tell you some more about that and, and just the explosion of activity that's occurred both at our center, but also, you know, worldwide. You know, the, the way we've been doing chemotherapy and radiation in the past will markedly change. You know, that would be obviously probably still for some people, and it's not going to change for all diseases simultaneously. But we're going to see that this uh, use of um, uh, DNA damaging agents, which is what they are, poisons. They're poisons. We will not be giving those types of therapies as much anymore and much as we did in the past. We're going to see these very specific therapies that kill the cancer. They will also be, have much fewer side effects. As you brought up was the reproductive health. You know, one thing that we can guarantee with you know, transplant in particular, but some chemotherapies generally is that they will decrease fertility. Uh, they can also uh, increase your chance of a second cancer because of the damage it does to your DNA. And what will happen with these very cell, these cell specific therapies is that that type of damage won't occur or would be much less likely. Okay, we've had a few um, COVID-19 specific questions too. Um, by constantly sanitizing our living spaces and wearing masks designed to keep out every manner of the bug, are we helping ourselves in the long run or are we becoming less able to fight off uh, the least of intruders? Yeah, so this, this is a good question. Um, so the one thing is, is that people need to understand what the purpose of the mask is. Now, unless you have an N95 mask and it's fitted properly, which most of you have not been fitted properly, um, but, but certainly, you know, you can make it as best as you can so that it's not coming through the sides in any way. If you have a regular mask or you're putting some type of handkerchief or, or handkerchief over the front of you, people have to understand that that's purely to protect others or at least reduce the effect of others. It does not protect you at all, okay? Now, the N95 does protect you. Um, and so if you have the N95 and you wear that properly, then that does protect you, okay? Um, the hand washing is probably the most important thing that you can do. Uh, the gloves, you know, are okay. They don't probably protect you that much uh, because people don't use gloves properly. And it's hard for me to explain over this. But the main thing is, is that, um, you know, uh, the social distancing is important. But I think if the other part of your question is, is that are we protecting ourselves from the virus today and yet we're not getting immunity to that virus because we're not allowing ourselves to be exposed? Well, you know, we, and you've heard this before, is that the, the, the problem is, is that if the, if the healthcare system is overwhelmed and we're at the brink in the, at Minnesota now, so keep in mind that we, are not, we haven't hit the, the surge yet, okay? You know, then when you get sick, whether it's a regular thing, like a heart attack or, you know, cancer side effect, therapy side effect, you know, uh, or something else, you know, um, or if you have COVID-19, there'll be no one to take care of you because there's only so many people that can be taken care of at once. And the one thing I haven't dis discussed with all of you, because it's actually quite frightening, is uh, all the triage planning I've been participating in of what if the worst circumstance occurs where there's not a sufficient number of ventilators or there's not enough blood, how would we decide who gets what? Remember in the triage circumstance, it's no longer an individual protecting, we're protecting the majority of people in society. And so the, it's, a, it's a whole new way of thinking that we're really unprepared for, at least most of us in medicine. But in any event, you know, the main thing is to slow the progress. So I would say that if you're over the age of 65 in particular, and you have any of those healthcare issues like heart disease, diabetes, those types of things, you need to stay away. And it's going to be a long time. If you're younger, you're going to be able to most likely survive it, uh, survive these, this, these complications. At least there's a most, there's a very good chance that you'll survive it. But, um, but it's it's not an easy it's not an easy decision, and I understand the concerns. But you don't want to get the virus, if, particularly if you're over the age of 65. Not today. And what do you know about the antibody tests that are now being used to determine if we've already had COVID-19? Um, are those okay. accurate? No, um, the, uh, they're they're not optimal. Um, so 
we know that there's a significant false positive and a significant false negative rate. A false negative means that you're really, you really have the antibody, but it doesn't detect it. Or even worse, it says you have the antibody, but you don't really have it. So why is that the case? So some of the kits that have been out there are, are detecting uh, the other coronaviruses. So that you could have a, a coronavirus cause a regular, causes a regular cold. There are six or seven different strains of coronavirus. I think the SARS-CoV-2 is the seventh. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, there's some cross-reactivity with prior, you know, with other uh, viruses that are in that family. And so, you know, that antibody will not protect you against the SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. So, um, so there's a lot of concern right now because a lot of these kits were developed in other countries. They're being exported or imported into the United States. They've not been quality control tested because of such great need. The FDA has approved them. So be a bit careful. And so even if you've been tested and found to have antibody today, when the better test kits come out in the not too distant future, you might need to get retested. Um, another question along that, are you seeing a difference in formation, strength, or strain of the coronavirus in different geographical locations of the outbreak? Yeah, so that, I, that part I only know as much as everybody else does in the, uh, you know, from the news and that there are, there are changes, there are mutations around the world uh, that are variable. However, none of them look so far significant enough of a, of a, of a change that might um, mean that the strain is more or less resistant or virulent. Um, but that's based on sort of computer models uh, more than anything else. So I'm certainly not the expert in virology, so I can't answer that question specifically. But uh, so far, you know, um, the, the feeling is generally, at least based on, you know, the, the, the scientific communities talking about it, is that uh, the strains all act, even though there's some genetic differences, they're all acting the same. Okay. Um, another question we've just gotten from a listener is, we hear so much daily about COVID-19 that it's challenging to know what exactly to believe. So much of normal life has changed. In your opinion, how do we move to a new normal? Well, I think that the new normal is going to only occur when we have, you know, uh, the, 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 the vaccines, you know. Um, but I think there's some things that we can do in the meantime that, that at least can make it less abnormal. And that is, is that you know, we have to figure out ways of how we better um, go back to work, for example, you know, or go to uh, restaurants or whatever that is, you know, that where there's, there's interaction between people. So we're gonna think about what that new normal could look like. And so it's gonna be more than social distancing, but you've already seen this when you go into, you know, uh, perhaps a grocery store where you'll see the plastic barriers that you didn't previously there, you know, only a, you know, a couple months ago. You know that's going to be more than normal. You know how are they going to redo? You know the 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 the, the airlines. You know the seating. You know they're talking about removing the middle seat, but you know that's not sufficient. They're going to probably have to come up with a new air handling system. You know, um, so there's things that can be done, and I think it just requires a think tank of individuals to really address what's needed for a restaurant versus work versus an airplane. You know, but they're all solvable. But of course, it costs money to make those changes, and, and certainly it's going to be a new business model moving forward, but it's going to come in steps. Hopefully in, let's say, two years, or hopefully less, but let's say in two years, it, 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 that's when we have the, the new vaccinations. You know, keep in mind, there are many people who don't believe in vaccinations. So that's another, it's not only you know, creating a vaccination, it's getting people to take the vaccination, it's also the, the manufacturing you know, of billions of, uh, of um, vaccinations. So um, there's a lot of things to get done. So that's why I'm thinking that, you know, it's gonna still be, you know, two, three years before we have an immune population. And you've heard about herd immunity. What that means is that if, you know, if there are, let's say 90% of the population is immune, that 10% will be protected by the others. But you have to have a certain threshold. And I think the threshold is around, you know, 70%. If you have 70%, then you can feel more protected, even if you are that cancer patient you know, or someone who has an immune, uh, poor immune system or the 65 year old patient, you know, then you can begin feeling more confident that you won't get it because everyone that surrounds you or most people that surround you are likely immune and so that protects you indirectly. So uh, kind of along this lines, with the government's funding of COVID-19 research in 2020 um, and beyond, 
uh, possibly next two, three, four, whatever years. Um, will that negatively impact the funding available to pediatric cancer researchers? Uh, I don't know the answer for sure yet, but my, my guess is yes. You know, first off, remember, it's not just, you know, the, um, the it's not just the, the interest in solving COVID-19. We have um, a, an economic crisis generally. So the amount of dollars that goes into the NIH, which is where the bulk of our money comes from, supporting cancer research, you know, is likely to be less. Um, be just because there aren't sufficient dollars to bail out, you know, uh, the, rec the rest of the economy. And so my guess is that we will depend more on philanthropy where there is philanthropy. Of course, we're, it will also depend on, you know, uh, certain industry, biotech. And that's actually one of the benefits of the Institute is that we have these key contacts with biotech and pharma. So we'll try to take advantage of all that and we'll do our best to minimize the negative impact of the economic crisis on, on cancer research. Um, but my guess is, is that we, you know, business will not be back to the same pace. Now, on the other hand, one of the reasons why I very quickly moved to COVID-19 research is if I can get those dollars, you know, indirectly that benefits the cancer research too. Because as I said, it's the same types of cells. I just have to spend less money when I repurpose it. You know, um, so in any case, you know, we're trying to be proactive and doing our best to minimize this. But you know, as I said in the very beginning, you know, we all come into this and how we can best help. You know, the mission, the missions now are refocused in a sense, but we're going to depend more on our community to help us support what we do to get through this crisis. Um, in many different ways, but also to maintain the, the original mission of finding new ways of curing childhood cancer. Um, here's another question out there, and we've talked about the vaccine a little bit. Um, in your opinion, when do you think it's realistic to see a vaccine approved? Um, well, I, you know, I, I know I was listening to the CNN and other news outlets you know, this morning, and you know you know, people don't really fully answer the question. And the reason being, um, well, so to answer your question, so I'm not repeating <laughs> what did, is that the answer is, uh, I bet it's gonna be, you know, two years. Okay. The re and two years is extraordinarily fast. But remember, everything else is fast track. So we've seen things that we haven't seen before. Uh, second point though, the reason why I think it's gonna be not faster is because, um, you know, there's lots of competition out there. Okay, so as you may know, there's already eight approved vaccine approaches. Okay, so that means they're going to be competing in a sense. That's not really a good thing if they have, you know, unless they really, what you want to do is you want to make sure you enroll as fast as possible. But, you know, things are oftentimes not black and white. And so, so if I give you the vaccine today, let's say that you never have been exposed to the virus. Okay, and now I'm going to give you the vaccine. The only way I know that it worked is if I now purposefully expose you to the virus. Many people don't like that part of it because you know you have to presume the vaccine doesn't work. Okay, you don't presume that it works. You presume that it doesn't work. The the so so, so enrollment may not be easy. Um, so we'll have to see. Now, obviously, there's many people out there also that are really uh, want to do something for society and they're going to be willing to do it but we'll see how quickly they enroll so we'll have different com we'll have some competition there which could be good or bad and we're going to have you know patients that are going to have to be willing to be exposed to the virus and then you're going to have to mass produce it and the mass production is no small deal um, so a lot of hurdles to overcome and you know we're used to creating vaccines um, but not at this scale at this pace um, and so uh, we'll see. I, I hope it's shorter than two years, but my guess is it will be longer or it would be two years or longer. Um, so when you say competition, is our ultimate goal to have one vaccine then? Well, our, our, goal, is to, uh, our goal is to enroll as, as fast as possible on, on a vaccine and then see if it works. Um, so the competition itself is not necessarily bad. It's only if it slows enrollment. Okay. Okay. 
Um, you've mentioned that cancer, that cancer research is presently on hold due to the COVID-19 crisis at the University of Minnesota. Is that the case at pretty much all labs across the country or? No, it, it, or, is, it is the case at all labs across the country, um, except that when I say, you know, that, that's occurred until now. And we're, we're now have the reopening plan. So we're gonna start seeing labs begin to open up again. Um, but remember, cancer research is, there's two parts of that. There's one in the labs, which is the developmental side, that's going to reopen. Um, and that opened this week, I believe it was this week, that opened at Mayo Clinic. Um, and so we're gonna be opening probably next week. So um, that's one thing. However, it's still a hard stop with regards to uh, cancer research in patients. So that, as you know, I have clinical trials where I'm try testing a new uh, drug or a new therapy out, and, and, but that's still a hard stop. No, no um, investigations in cancer patients because uh, of the concern that we will take more of the PPE that is so necessary or it's just the general care. So, so parts of this are yes, we will restart. Parts of it, no, not yet. And this, that's hard. That's hard for me because most of my income, you know, for my studies comes from the actual clinical testing. And so everything, whether it's industry trial or whether it's my own trial, it's stopped. Um, we've talked a lot about, about what, how you've been studying things in cancer research that has uh, related to COVID-19. Have you learned anything specifically from COVID-19 that can be brought back to your work? cancer? Um, no, not yet. Um, that's a good question because, you know, the reason why not yet is because we're just now taking it into patients. And so we haven't done it yet. So this is just, just about to happen. Um, so, uh, you know, what we've done so far is that we've repurposed our current cell therapies for cancer and are about to test them in, in, in patients with COVID-19. However, um, you know, in some of the strategies, for example, with the ADAM17 you know, uh, enzyme that I was telling you about, how we would produce that antibody, that's something that we are first testing in COVID-19 that was being thought about for a treatment in cancer. So that is one example where, you know, immediate example that I can think of where um, it's not so much that it's teaching us more to go back to cancer, it's just that it's going to get a fast track so that we can get this up and going for COVID-19, and then we can employ it, you know, um, having used that money for COVID-19 for COVID research, and we'll apply it to cancer. So there'll be probably more of that, but I haven't thought about it from that direction before. Okay, well, Dr. Wagner, thank you. We have some of Children Cancer Research Fund's most loyal supporters on this webinar today, and I know people who are passionate about finding better treatments for kids and for cancer. And I think we all know that cancer hasn't paused during this pandemic. Uh, what else do you want us to know specifically about the needs of researchers and physicians right now, and how can we help? Well, I, I think that, you know, th there's a couple of things. One is that, um, you know, first off, you know, as I mentioned, you know, that we have the general economic crisis and it affects everyone, not just, you know, the people, you know, uh, you know in the lab or, or you know, um, and the, the work getting done, um, but you know if you know if there are people on the on this today, you know that have the capacity to even under these hard economic times to help us, you know, pay for these new studies that for which we have no funding for, um, that would be great. In addition, you know, uh, to give you one concrete example that I'm worried about personally is is. Uh, you know, a program project grant, which has been focused on cancer research, you know, since uh, 1997, something like that, um, is now in this 20 some year, whatever it is. Um, that, that program project grant uh, is due to be submitted on the 25th of September. And the reason why that's so, why it's the problem is because if I can't submit it on the 25th of September, a September, I've got to wait a year. And I don't think I'm going to be ready now because I've been shut down since February. So what that means is there'll be a year of no funding, you know, uh, for this program project grant that has been focused on um, 
finding new T cell therapies and NK cell therapies uh, for different kinds of cancer. And so um, that's going to be a hardship. And how we get through that, I don't know. Um, as I've always said, I believe that you know, if we have good ideas and we have you know a, a track record of success, somewhere the money will come from. And I'll be hoping to go to the institution, although you know, as you heard, they're losing five hundred thousand dollars a day. Um, I'll go to look for anywhere I can go. But you know, if there is the possibility of any support from this group, you know, know that it's going to a um, we're going to projects that have been already NIH, you know, uh, approved uh, and peer reviewed, um, but we got to get through this um, um, deep, <laughs> dark period to continue the work. Um, you know, but in addition, you know, the one thing that I thought about as I was talking to Kenna and John um, a few days, uh, a week ago. Was just that you know where where, where did where did the most significant changes come from when you think about in a global sense of you know where that where those biomedical revolutions come from that really have changed everything you know um, and there's a, it actually really come, comes down to one thing it's a new technology a new technology and usually in the form of some a piece of equipment. Um, and you know, the one thing I've thought about in this, my discussions with John Hallberg uh, is, is that you know there is a new piece of equipment uh, which is going to be crucial and it actually can impact also COVID-19. Um, and that piece of equipment is it's called a mass spectrometer. And what that does is that it's a it's a it, the machine itself is called a Cytoff, um, and it itself costs about six hundred fifty thousand dollars. Um, and about 150,000 for reagents to go to, to run it. But I've just started using this and creating a team to, to use this. Uh, but we, right now we send out to Stanford. Um, but it's something that we need to be able to get ourselves. And so as I think about the different things that we might do that will make a tremendous difference in the future, um, a couple of ideas is one is you know, helping support the research that is ongoing. Uh, that is in this period of no funding because it's happened so fast. Um, but in addition, there could be these sort of groundbreaking pieces of equipment that um, you just can't just buy because of the, the size of the cost uh, itself. But, you know, clearly, uh, of course, we recognize that this is an economic hard time for everybody. Uh, it's not what we, any of us predicted or could have anticipated. But still, at the end of the day, you know, we're all fighting this battle in one way or the other. And some people have different types of skills or resources. Some people will be, you know, getting that PPE on and facing the day-to-day, the -day, you know, care of patients. Others of us will try to create the next future uh, therapy that will prevent this disease and cancer uh, basically at the same time. And there's others that, you know, people that where they just want to help and they have the resources to do that. And that's no small you know, uh, deal as well. And so really, as I've said before many times, and even you know, at your house last year, was um, you know, it's a community effort um, and that we're trying to not only do something that changes the practice of medicine, but also uh, to take care of our kids. As I said, it takes the village and we're the village. Wow, well, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us today and keeping us informed with what's going on and how we can help. And to all of our attendees today, thank you for you know taking an hour out of your day to spend with us. And I encourage you to visit childrenscancer.org in the coming days and weeks for continued updates on childhood cancer research, on the impact of COVID-19 on the research we're doing and on any ways that you can help, especially with things that Dr. Wagner was just talking about. So. Um, okay, can you hold on, hold, can hold on for one second? Say, can you hold for one second? Yes. <laughs> hold on for one second. <laughs> Here's our baby. <laughs> <laughs> this is my baby girl. Anyway, I want to thank you all for everything you that you've done. What's that? How long ago did you get her? Oh, she's now two. Yep. So, but anyway, so she she loves the fact that I'm here. Uh, 
<laughs> However, she doesn't understand why I can't be playing all the time when I'm home. So, uh, so work continues, uh, but, um, but anyway, she provides us with a lot of getting through these hot, long days. Oh, but anyway, okay. Carrie, thanks so much again, thanks and I wish we had been able to come. Thank you, Lisa, for, for being with us today. We appreciate it. Oh, our pleasure. Thanks Thank so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs>